been Roy uh, doing a tour of Rome, and for any of you who have visited Rome and gone on a tour with Roy or any of his employees who are specialists in the very rich and deep Jewish history of Italy and all the various artifacts that you can find throughout Rome, I thoroughly encourage you to make contact with him on any future visits. It certainly opens one's eyes and sees a whole new aspect of Rome. And this is one of the things that Roy specializes in. You know, I've been asking him, what's your life mission? Like, how do you feel about what you're actually doing? So he says to me like this, he said, look, he's trying to connect dots over the history of Jews from the time slightly before um, the destruction of the Second Temple when the Maccabees first uh, set up camp in Rome. And he's portrayed and connected dots throughout history in the relationship of the Jews with the Roman Empire and all through the periods of the, uh, the Inquisition right up until current day uh, Jewish life in Rome. Thank you, Peter, for a lovely introduction. I want to thank the Rav and uh, the Bayat. Um, I've been, this is my fifth time here. You were so lucky. Four times you kept me from speaking, but the fifth time's the charm. <laughs> The, um, I also want to thank uh, David for filming and Charles for uh, running the computer for me and, um, and uh, Elaine for putting everything together. So uh, thanks to everybody for great teamwork. And thank you, Toronto, for this attendance. This is amazing. Uh, you folks are terrific. Every time I come to Canada, I applaud you. And uh, being a, still a citizen of Obama land, I applaud you even more. <laughs> but I have no opinion. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, politics, by the way, um, in the Jewish tradition, it is forbidden for me to embarrass or humiliate anyone in public. So to keep me from doing that, can we turn off cell phones and ringers now? Because <laughs> I would hate to do that. Anyway, um, it's more of an issue in Italy and Israel when I speak. Babies are born going, hello, hello? Can you, can you hear me now? I, of course, always have to start with a joke, and I'll tell you uh, a new joke that's running around both Israel and Rome. Uh, can you all hear me all right? If you can't, you're not missing anything. Uh, the Ayatollah of Iran, Khamenei, um, he is very concerned about uh, Israel not backing down in its demands, and he's very worried about his future. He's very worried. It's a joke, don't worry. He, um, <laughs> he uh, is so nervous that he wants to know. He becomes obsessed with finding out the day he's going to die. And uh, they tell him, oh, uh, Ayatollah, Ayatollah, you need to find uh, an astrologer. An astrologer will tell you the day you are going to die. So he says, get me an astrologer now. And he said, you just hang the last one. <laughs> so he says, find me one, find me one. And they scour all of uh, Iran in, in a cavern outside of Tehran. They find the last astrologer hiding out. And they drag him, kicking and screaming to the Ayatollah's palace. And they throw him in front of the Ayatollah Khamenei. And, and he says, astrologer, tell me. I want to know the day I'm going to die. And he gets his birth date and the hour, and he unrolls all the charts with the planets and the stars and the moons and the hours and the degrees. And after a couple hours, uh, he's shaking like a leaf, the astrologer. He says, uh, Honorable Ayatollah, uh, I'm so sorry to tell you, but the stars and the planets, they say, you are going to die on a Jewish holiday. He says, what? That's impossible. That's unthinkable. No, check it all again. So he had, the poor astrologer has to go over everything again, the chart, the moon, the planets, the stars. Da, 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 da. And after a couple of hours, he says, Ayatollah, I'm so sorry, but the planets, the stars, they do not lie. You are going to die on a big, big Jewish holiday. And he says, what horrible Jewish holiday? What cursed Jewish holiday will I die on? And he says, any day you die will be a big Jewish holiday. <laughs> So 
So now we can talk about the Renaissance. Can we? Okay, the year, we're gonna get serious now. The year that starts us off is 1475. Three things happen all in the same year. One thing is in Northern Italy, in Trent, uh, we have the blood libel. Simonetto, little Simon, a Christian baby, is found dead. And the Jews get the blame, and they name all the leaders of the Jewish community of Trent, the, uh, the heads of the Kihilot and the Rabbanim, and they put the names there. This is a painted wood carving uh, imprint from 1475 of the Jews killing the Christian baby to get his blood to make the matzah. In the same year, we have this family taking over the Vatican uh, a little bit beforehand. I call this the portrait of the Godfather. Uh, the man seated is Pope Sistus IV of the Della Rovere family. Um, now, uh, this is a good thing for you to know if you ever visit the Vatican. Uh, anything that a pope does and commissions, his name gets put on it. So if it's a pope named Paul, his projects are Pauline, the Pauline Chapel, the Pauline Wall, whatever. Leo, Leonine, uh, whatever. And uh, in this case, Sistus, anything he makes is Sistine. And he orders them to make a chapel for the Pope. So royal palatial chapel in the Vatican for the Pope's private masses. And that chapel is now the Sistine. So you won't make the mistake that US tourists make every time, every day in the Vatican. Uh, they come out all the time and they say, our guy cheated us. We didn't see the 15 other chapels. We only saw the 16th. <laughs> now, by the way, there's going to be some sugyas here, some Talmudic deviations. It's in the blood. So um, uh, we have an unspoken competition every year amongst all the people who do VIP guiding in Rome for the stupidest tourist question of the year. <laughs> And I'm from the United States, and I can tell you, US citizens love to win contests. <laughs> they win every year. So uh, some of my favorites, uh, let me see, there's, uh, oh, there was an American Catholic woman inside St. Peter's Basilica, her guide came running out because he had to tell all of us, oh, I got the winner this year. <laughs> There, she's in with a Catholic group with her Catholic Italian guide inside St. Peter's Basilica, and she says, excuse me, um, how many centuries before Christ did they build this church? <laughs> My all-time favorite, let me see. I heard one, I got the winner when we were filming the documentary. We were, uh, Felix, you remember this? I, I was walking to meet you guys in Florence, and there were American art students. The, you know, the parents pay a fortune for them to go spend six to nine months in an Italian town like Rome or Florence to soak up the atmosphere, learn Italian, and, uh, and become uh, experts in art history. Mostly, they become experts in uh, So um, uh, this uh, one valley girl was with her friends, and she's looking at a book, and she says, uh, girls, girls, uh, do you know what city we have to go to see the Tower of Pisa? <laughs> and the all time, my all time favorite, I think it's the winner of all times, another American tourist right in front of a masterpiece by uh, Michelangelo, uh, his Moses. He, it's an amazing statue of Moses. Uh, and uh, the American tourists are looking at this magnificent colossal sculpture of Moses. And uh, she turns to her guy. I can't believe this one myself, but it's true. <laughs> Sadly, it's true. Uh, and she said, uh, excuse me, but how long did Moses have to pose? <laughs> 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 So I'm making Aliyah. 
Anyway, <laughs> and these are all true. You can't make this stuff up. Um, so getting back to the Sistine family, the Sistus family, Sistus IV, he's the man who commissions the building of this chapel to be the royal palatial chapel of the popes forever. Now, uh, he has several uh, what he calls nephews. We're not sure of what the blood relation is because, uh, because the popes ordered that we do not have in the Italian language back then and today a word to distinguish between grandsons and nephews. It's all the same in Italian because we don't, they didn't want us to know if these are sons or grandsons or nephews. But uh, all the guys standing up are just a few of his innumerable quote unquote nephews. Uh, the very dour one here kind of looks like Lurch from the Adams family with a, <laughs> with a bad haircut. Uh, yeah. Or he insulted his barber and then fell asleep, I don't know. Anyway, that's his tonsure, of course, to be a cardinal. Uh, this is Cardinal Giuliano del Rovere. And 30 years after his uncle, Sistus IV, dies, after a pause of several popes, he becomes Pope Julius II, the arch enemy of Michelangelo. And uh, he has an incredibly violent temper when he's pope inside the Vatican while he's alive. Everybody in the Vatican calls him, except not to his face, of course. Il Papa Terribile, the scary pope. He beats people up in public. He even broke his staff beating up Michelangelo in public in front of uh, visitors, embarrassing Michelangelo. He, he beat up cardinals and bishops. Uh, he was very violent, but a great, great talent scout for the Renaissance. The man had incredible taste, bringing all the artists out of Florence. He single-handedly moves the Renaissance from from Florence to Rome. Uh, so uh, we're going to learn more about him later. Um, by the way, this kind of corruption, it does not exist anymore in the Vatican since about 1799. Napoleon Bonaparte put an end to it. Um, the, uh, this practice of putting all your quote unquote nephews into positions of power to make the family richer and richer and richer by doing uh, very unpapal things. Um, the word in medieval Italian for nephew is nepote, and this is the system of nepotismo, nepotism, and it's, uh, this family was very, very good at it. Um, so 1475, we have the uh, commission to start building the Sistine Chapel. We have the blood libel against the Jews of Trent, which uh, starts some very horrible situations for the Jews around all of Europe. And one third thing happens in 1475. A baby is born in Caprese in the center of Tuscany in Italy, in marble country, and his name is Michelangelo Buonarroti. He's born in the very same year as the Sistine Chapel, and his fate and that of the chapel are entwined together forever. You know, the next. Now, uh, this is a very rare shot of the outside of the Sistine Chapel. Um, to get this shot, you have to crawl on your belly on the roof of St. Peter's Church. I know that because I took the photo. Uh, now, uh, the man who built it, Baccio Pontelli, was from Florence. And this is something very important for us to understand about what's going on back then in, 14, in the late 1400s. Florence is sort of the Haight-Ashbury or the Greenwich Village or the Berkeley of its day. It's very bohemian and it's very open-minded. Uh, they loved the Jews. They were proud as Christians to have Jewish roots and Jews were sought out. Rabbis and Kabbalistic experts and great teachers were brought to Florence to study elbow to elbow with their Christian friends. And uh, the Christians all wanted to learn about us. Why? Because the Florentines were fascinated with the great mystical wisdom of the ancient world. They wanted to know the mystical wisdom of ancient Egypt, of Babylonia, of ancient pagan Greece, and the Kabbalah. They had a problem. There were no dead Egyptians they could talk to to help them decode Egyptian magic and mysticism. The same with ancient pagan Greece, and uh, the same with Babylonia, 
There was only one group that had living representatives in an unbroken chain of receiving the information. Talking about receiving information, in Hebrew that's Kabbalah. And they went to the Jews, and they brought the Jews into Florence, and they were thrilled with the Jews and treated them very, very respectfully, and, in, uh, and there were great friendships. Now, um, we'll talk even more about that later. So, if you're talking about architects, engineers, sculptors, and painters, and poets, and authors, and philosophers of Florence at the end of the 1400s, they have all been exposed to Jewish wisdom literature. They've studied some Torah, some Talmud, some uh, Midrash, the oral tradition, and some Kabbalah, the mystical tradition. They're all doing it. If you talk about the greatest names of the Florentine Renaissance, they've all been exposed to it. They're studying it illegally inside the palace of the number one family of Florence, the de' Medici's. Um, now, um, in Rome, this was all completely illegal. The Vatican and an Inquisition of the period wanted complete schism between the Jews and the Christians. Zero contact was their goal. Um, and uh, in Rome, they were absolutely against anybody learning anything about the Jewish roots of Christianity. Whereas in Florence, everybody was getting along great. So this was a huge source of friction between the two cities. They hated each other's guts. What do we have here in Canada? Edmonton and uh, <laughs> Calgary, is it? OK. And uh, what? What? Okay, uh, uh, and um, you know, in, in Italy today we have Milan and Naples, in Australia it's Sydney and Melbourne, Israel, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. You get two cities that have co two completely different mentalities, and that's what it is like back then at the end of the 1400s, early 1500s. Now, um, this architect, when he gets this incredibly prestigious commission, he says, I'm going to look in the Jewish roots. So he goes to the Book of Kings in the Jewish Bible, where Samuel, the prophet Shmuel Hanavi, describes it's a do-it-yourself Beit HaMikdash, make your own holy temple. He gives every single measurement proportion of King Solomon's first holy temple in Jerusalem. And he says, I'm going to make it again. Now, in the Talmud, in the Tractate of Megillah, it specifically says a Jewish architect can't build a copy of the Jewish Holy Temple anywhere else until the third one is finally built on uh, the uh, Temple Mount. Uh, so a Jewish architect couldn't do this. A Catholic architect did. You're looking at the world's only full-size working copy of the Heichal, the central hallway of King Solomon's Holy Temple in Jerusalem. It's the exact size, the exact dimensions. Um, the, the decoration's a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, give me. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was inaugurated in 1481. Now, uh, the ceiling was inspired by ceilings of synagogues back then. If you go to the great synagogue of Rome today, you'll see most of the ceiling is a night sky with golden stars. Now, the idea was from the dream of Jacob, which we read in synagogue last week, that um, he has his vision of the ladder with the angels coming down to earth and going back up, and he says, Zesh al Shaman, this is the gate to heaven. This is a holy place. Now, in the synagogues, they would have in golden calligraphy in Hebrew, this is the gate of heaven, Zeshaal HaShemayim. Uh, they didn't do that in the churches, but they liked the idea of the vault of heaven, the starry night sky that they saw in synagogues, and they copied it in a lot of churches. And there are churches all over Italy with the starry night sky that they get the idea from the uh, decorations of synagogues. So you see there's this cross-pollination culturally already happening. Uh, there was another reason. 
it was really difficult grunt work to get up on these little scaffolds, these rickety things, and bend yourself into a knot to paint a ceiling. Uh, it's called fresco, which means fresh or wet. You take fresh plaster, smooth it out, and as soon as it's smooth, you immediately have to start painting it before it dries. You've got 24 to 48 hours. And they would have the garzoni, which are the, the little boy assistants, whose bodies were like rubber, and they could fit these tiny gaps on top of the uh, platforms and the scaffolding to get up there and just splash a lot of uh, blue paint around, throw up some gold stars. It didn't take any talent. And that's all ceilings in all Christian buildings until Michelangelo. It was a grunt job, and it was a job for kids and junior assistants. No self-respecting artist would ever paint a ceiling. Uh, when he's forced to paint the ceiling, it's like slapping him in the face in public. Um, now, this Baccio Pontelli, the architect, when he makes this, uh, he has designers do the floor, and the floor is a key to understanding what's going on in art in Italy in the Renaissance. Uh, the floor is this priceless mosaic tile floor of all precious marble and different stones. And it, if you look at it through a Catholic point of view, it shows the choreography of a papal mass where the Pope would stop and listen to the choir sing a hymn. Um, when you get into this part, uh, you'll see the places where holy water would be dispersed or incense would be swung, and what we would call the moves of the choreography of a papal mass. At the very same time, if you come in from a Jewish perspective with an eye for Kabbalistic symbolism, you can see that the entire floor of the Sistine Chapel is a uh, mechanism for doing Kabbalistic meditation. You have the 10 attributes of God, the Sifirot, the Tree of Life, the Columns, uh, the Four Worlds, the 10 Spheres, all of it is in the floor. Uh, right here is to this very day uh, the place where the Pope must kneel before going towards the altar. Why? In the Jewish holy temple, there was the parochet, the curtain to separate the holy area from the holy of holies. Now, uh, the architect said, you know what, the holy of holies, I'm gonna make it closer to heaven. So there's a step up there. It's about five or six inches higher than the rest of the floor. And the Pope, before going through the veil, this grill, or uh, in Latin, the mechitza, <laughs> I love being in the Sistine and telling people, let's go through the Mechitza now. And they go, it, there is, it's right there, the Mechitza. It's a big marble Mechitza. Um, anyway, uh, before going through the Mechitza, the Pope kneels here, meditates, then they open the door, he takes a step up and goes into the Holy of Holies. Now, um, where the altar is in this wall. This is the altar wall, the way it looked originally, with two huge windows and lots of... Um, architectural detail and the railing, all of that. Uh, we'll know, we need to know that for later on. Uh, anyway, this whole floor is filled with Kabbalah. Where the Pope kneels, he's in the center of 10 sefirot, 10 spheres. And uh, Michelangelo does a special effect there that you have to be in the room to believe it. It's out of control. So right off the bat, you've got something that at first blush, you look at it, oh, this is totally Christian, it's totally Catholic. But if you come in from another training, another background, another set of eyes, it's right there in your face, it's Jewish Kabbalah. And all the artists are pulling this off. Now, uh, the floor, <coughs> this is the floor of the Sistine Chapel. Now, you're not allowed to take any photographs in the Sistine Chapel, ever unless they let you in there alone at night. I'm a very lucky person. This is how I did a lot of my research. I would be in there with just two, three people, and uh, they, they gave me the honor of uh, letting me take some photos. This is not just any piece of floor. You know, during the conclave, the voting to elect a new pope, um, it's in the Sistine Chapel. I'd be too distracted by all the gorgeous artwork to be uh, focused on the voting, but this is where they vote. And right here is where they put the mini furnace to burn the ballots, to make the black smoke and the white smoke. And it sits right on these. You can even see places where embers fell out of the oven over the centuries and burned some of the marble. Now, um, this is not 
in the time of Michelangelo, the symbol of the Jewish people. It is not called the Magain David. This is the seal of Solomon. And the idea was, throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, if you meditated on this seal of Solomon, the, it was the key to understanding all the mystical wisdom of the entire ancient world. The Jews were the key, the passageway, to get to all mystical wisdom. So uh, it's the, uh, the idea is that the choice of the new pope is based on the mystical wisdom of the Jewish Kabbalah. Uh, and that's in the Sistine Chapel. And it's not just here, the entire floor, for those of you who have been there in the Sistine, the, um, the entire floor is filled with seals of Solomon. It only becomes the Star of David and the Jewish symbol in the early 1600s, two centuries later. <laughs> Now, this is that part of the floor I told you about. This is where the Pope kneels inside the ten spheres. Now, um, this photo also proves that I'm not a professional photographer because I left my backpack right there. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, now, you see this little gray ramp here. This here is the step up we saw in that first uh, image of the Sistine when it was new. So what happened? In 1555, an incredibly hate-filled pope, Paul IV, Carafa, uh, that was his family name, he was a monster to both the Jews and to his own Christians. Uh, he mistreated everybody equally. When he's elected pope, he walks in the Sistine Chapel, he says, this chapel is way too Jewish. Move that mechitza and he ordered the people to rip this huge, heavy marble partition grill out of the ground off of this step and move it several feet east to break the perfect correspondence between the Sistine Chapel and the Jews' holy temple. And he changed a few other things to make sure it was no longer a perfect copy of the Jewish holy temple. So now this is inside the Meritza instead of going uh, outside the Meritza to come into the Holy of Holies. Uh, but the um, optical effect that Michelangelo made connected with this still works. Um, basically, there are fake architectural elements all over the ceiling, trompe l'oeil pedestals that are all crooked. Everything else in the ceiling is dead on perfect, except all these pedestals that are painted by him all over the ceiling, everyone is crooked. And then you stand right there where the Pope kneels, and they move. They don't really physically move. It's a, an effect in art called uh, anamorphosis that makes you think that a static piece of art is moving, like Mona Lisa's eyes, that you think that they're moving. Uh, the entire ceiling moves and points right at your head. This is Tiferet in Kabbalah. This is the center of the entire tree of life in the universe. When you stand there, you become the center of the attention of the entire room. It unites the entire room. Now, Michelangelo is not the first Christian artist to start hiding stuff in his work. I told you all about Florence. Well, when they first are making the chapel 30 years before Michelangelo, um, they get the top 10 artists from Florence to come in and fresco the walls. Now the walls, that's prestigious work because everybody can see it, it's easy, it's closer to the eye, you don't have to break your neck looking up. So uh, all the artists wanted the commissions to do wall frescoes and nobody wanted to do ceilings. So 30 years before Michelangelo, all the best painters in Florence are ordered to come and decorate the side walls. So what do they do? On uh, this, uh, on this side, from left to right, in Christian order, is the life of Jesus, like a graphic novel, panel by panel by panel. On this side, right to left, in Hebrew order, is the life of Moses, panel by panel by panel. And they twin the different critical events in the lives of Moses and Jesus to make a bridge. This is what the Florentines are trying to say. The roots of our faith come from the Jews, and we're proud of that. Meanwhile, Rome and the Vatican, the Inquisition, are intolerant, cutting Jews and any Jewish reference out of anything, and persecuting the Jews. So um, 
they don't like Pope Sixtus IV. This is, again, 30 years before Julius II forcing Michelangelo to paint the ceiling. Uh, this is just one example. They sabotage all the artwork. Every single panel in the, in the walls of the Sistine, 30 years before Michelangelo, is all insults to the Pope, to Rome, to the Sistine family, and to the Sistine Chapel and the Vatican. I'll give you a couple examples here. Uh, this, of course, is the story of um, the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, they didn't really understand the original Hebrew so well, so they made the Red Sea really red. Um, and of course, there's a, an amud, there's a uh, column of smoke and fire between the Egyptians and Jews, so they put in a Roman column <laughs> sitting there. So uh, they were not as scholarly about Jewish stuff as Michelangelo became. Now, um, here's Pharaoh in the army drowning in the Red Sea, the Jews in the back, there's Miriam singing the song. And uh, way up here, you have to understand, in Renaissance art, in these huge panels, think of a comic book, it's not just one single event. They put several different things and then the big dramatic climax, the parting Red Sea, think of you know, the Hollywood, the big climactic event, that center stage right here, the kaboom, the huge miracle. But other parts of the story, like after they drown, Miriam sings the song, and before everything else, you've got Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh, saying, let my people go, and the plagues happen all over Egypt. So they have several of the plagues, the darkness, the hail, all of that. Um, so we've got one event, another set of events, the main event, and over here. And that's typical of a lot of these frescoes. So uh, the first event is Moses and uh, Aaron go before Pharaoh, the evil Pharaoh, and say, let my people go. Now, um, the uh, family colors of the Sistine family, the Pope Sistus, are, um, are blue and gold. Those are his family colors. Can we take a close up at Moses and Aaron meeting the evil Pharaoh. Let's click that again. Here we go. You have to really have eagle eyesight or binoculars, which they didn't have back then, or be looking for this. Moses and Aaron are going before the evil Pharaoh, who's dressed up in the robes of Pope Sistus the <laughs> Fourth. And right next to them are the plagues, and this building is being destroyed by the flood waters of the Red Sea parting, and it just happens to be the Sistine Chapel that they're painting in at the same time. These guys are having way too much fun. Uh, now, the Vatican caught one or two of these, centuries later, they caught one or two of these things and they wrote about it, and they said, well, now it's all famous historical works, we can't change them. So they're stuck with every single bat. They didn't know that it was every single panel that were insults. And in the book, we, we talk about some of the insults, and they're pretty harsh. Um, let's keep going, please. OK, now, Michelangelo comes to Rome, and he's somewhat famous and successful in Florence, <laughs> but he's nobody in Rome. And they hate Florentines in Rome. Now, uh, he's got one shot to make a career in Rome. Uh, an extremely powerful and rich French cardinal wants to commission his own funeral monument um, in the most important chapel in the Vatican at the end of the 1400s. And all the top sculptors in Rome put out their clay proposals, scale models of what they're going to do, this huge, giant monument in, in, in very expensive Carrara marble. And he puts in his proposal in a terracotta model, and he beats all of the established star sculptors of Rome. And he's only 22, and he's from Florence. They hate his guts. So by making that, he becomes the new rising star in the art world in Rome. And uh, he takes his new, newfound fame and success, and he goes around insulting every painter and every painting in Rome. He hates painting. He loves three-dimensional art. He loves sculpture and clay and terracotta and wax, but he hates painting and painters. So all the painters in Rome get together and they do a mafia move on him. Uh, it's now 30 years after that original starry night sky in the Sistine, 
and it, the building is too heavy for the soft soil, the whole thing is settled, it's starting to cave in, and the whole roof, the whole ceiling is uh, filled with plaster and bricks keeping it from falling down entirely. It's a mess. It's, uh, they can't salvage it, they have to make a new ceiling. So all the artists in Rome go to the Pope, who is now Julius II, Il Papa Terribile, and they go, uh, Your Holiness, we know just the guy who would love to repaint your uncle's ceiling, the Florentine kid. Oh, he'd be terrific. And they haul poor Michelangelo in front of Julius II. And he says, I hear you're good. He says, well, yeah, I love sculpting. Well, now you're going to paint. He says, oh, no. He says, well, OK, I'll give you two options, paint or die. <laughs> Michelangelo says, I think I have a new hobby. <laughs> so now he has to do the most insulting job in Rome. He has to paint a ceiling, which is junior assistant work. And he's a grown man. He's in his 30s. Um, and he had, you know what he, he's frescoed before the ceiling with the plaster and the paint? Nothing. He's never done this in his life. Imagine I take somebody here who's never painted before. I drag you into the Louvre. I give you a plain piece of wood next to the Mona Lisa and say, OK, Paint something just as good or better than the Mona Lisa or to you and your family. And that's the situation Michelangelo is in. He has to paint the ceiling on top of these wall frescoes that are done by the greatest fresco artists in the entire Renaissance. And they know he's going to be either humiliated or quit. And he gets this job. They think it's going to take him eight years. He pushes himself past human limits. He sleeps up on the scaffold. He eats up there. He, uh, he's almost living up there. He doesn't change his clothes for months at a time. And he um, finishes it in less than four and a half years because he just wants to get out of there. He wants to get it done. Also, the pope is very sick. He wants to make sure it's finished before the pope dies because the next pope might just cancel out the entire project because it's not finished. And they don't like Julius II in there. So it would very well run the risk of being destroyed, even if it was halfway done. So he's got to get it done. Now, the pope gives him a very simple commission. I know you hate painting. I'll make it simple, Michelangelo. Over the door in the back where I and all the popes walk in forever, put Jesus to bless me, my family. And, uh, and the chapel. Over the front altar wall, remember I showed you that with the two big windows? I want you to put Mary because the chapel is dedicated to her uh, when she dies and is assumed up into heaven, the assumption. Uh, so the, the chapel is dedicated to her. I was with a whole yeshiva in Rome, in, in the Vatican. I was telling them the Sistine Chapel is dedicated to the Madonna. And they go, oh, cool, Madonna. <laughs> Sababa, Madonna. I said, no, 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 the other one. <laughs> now, I hate to drop names, but I got to tell that story to the other Madonna. And she loved that, that they thought of her first. <laughs> so uh, anyway. Uh, the Pope says, OK, there's these little triangles around the ceiling that were just starry night skies. From, uh, I want you to put the apostles, the followers of Jesus, in the triangles. On the four corners, there's a tradition in Christian art. You're painting a ceiling. The four corners have to be the four writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they have to symbolically hold up the vault of heaven, hold up the ceiling. That, that's a given. Now. Um, Michelangelo sets up this amazing engineering feat. Uh, he had taught himself ancient Roman architecture, and he makes this incredible bow-shaped bridge in the air, pressing against the side walls, so he doesn't block up the whole chapel with scaffolding wood, so the Pope can use it day in and day out while he's up there painting. And he covers the whole bottom of his arch bridge with a thick drop cloth. He tells the Pope, I don't want to drip any paint on your lovely outfits. So the Pope can go underneath and not get uh, spilled on. Uh, what he really wanted that for was so the Pope couldn't look up through the scaffolding and find out that Michelangelo breaks the contract on day one. <laughs> Where he's supposed to paint Jesus over the door of the Pope's, he paints a minor Jewish prophet, Zechariah. 
And what Michelangelo does with all of his Hebrew prophets on the ceiling, he's afraid after he dies, they'll say, oh, no, that's really a Catholic saint. He labels all of them. <laughs> Can't get away with anything with Michelangelo. Now, why a minor Hebrew prophet, Zechariah? Zechariah is the one who sees the vision of the Holy Temple rebuilt. Michelangelo is saying, I know what the room is. Um, he's also the one who tells the high priest in the Holy Temple, you're filthy. It's your actions. You have to cleanse yourself. You have to clean up your act. And he's sending a message, the very first painting, to Pope Julius II, clean up your act. You're not acting like a spiritual leader. Um, now, how does he get away with it? Remember, this is a very violently tempered pope. Um, well, uh, he knows that the pope is an egomaniac. All the fresco work that's done for him everywhere, it's gotta, they gotta put his portrait in everything. The room he sleeps in, the room he works in, he has to look at himself everywhere or he's not happy. Uh, and he has a lot of portraits made of himself. So Michelangelo decides to schmooze the Pope in, uh, in his artwork. Now, this is not an imaginary face that he sticks on the prophet Zechariah. This is a beautiful, very prettied up, very photoshopped and retouched, flattering profile of Pope Julius II. Uh, so uh, Pope Julius II takes one look at Zechariah. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You put me in the place of Jesus? I'm good with that. <laughs> and he, he gives Michelangelo carte blanche. He says, OK, I trust you. Do whatever you want. Um, and Michelangelo changes the entire thing. Now, let me tell you, uh, those of you who already know the information, don't cheat. Let's let other people guess. The Sistine Chapel ceiling that he has to do is still the record holder for the largest painting on planet Earth. Uh, for those who think in feet, it's 14,000 square feet. For people who think in meters, it's 1,200 square meters. It's even bigger than my apartment. Uh, anyway, um, the, um, the ceiling is filled with hundreds of images. Now, this is the most important Christian chapel on planet Earth. What percentage of this immense 14,000 square feet, 1,200 square meters, what percentage is filled with Christian figures and symbolism? Those of you who don't know the answer, I want to hear your guesses. What would you guess? Ten percent? That's really low. Uh, anybody else? What? Zero? What would you say? A quarter, 25 percent of it. Um, anybody else? I feel like I'm doing an auction in reverse. Uh, well, those people who were really cynical and said zero, you're absolutely correct. 14,000 square feet, 1,200 square meters, not one single Christian figure or symbol. Uh, anyway, now Michelangelo has schmoozed the Pope, the Pope's happy, his face is up there looking handsomer than he ever was in real life, and all the Popes forever have to pass under his bare feet. He loves this, he loves this. But Michelangelo, remember, he hates this job, he hates painting, he hates Julius II, so he's gotta get a little dig in there. So you see that there are two putti, putti means uh, they're not quite angels or cherubs, there's no wings, no halos, but they're little baby innocent figures that are all over the Sistine, and they are the signals, they're the directionals telling you where to look. So these two little putti, you see them over here, are reading the prophecies of Zechariah over his shoulder. Now one is leaning on his buddy. Now, Michelangelo illegally taught himself human anatomy. He was one of the three top experts in human anatomy in Europe in his lifetime because he did illegal dissections of uh, corpses of executed criminals. It was completely illegal to dissect back then, and of course, he didn't respect that law either. So um, he knew if I'm leaning on somebody, my hand is gonna hang down like this. It's not gonna form a fist. But if we look in carefully what this fist is, let's take a look. One more time. Here we go. 
He's got his thumb a little bit blurry and darkened on purpose. But you see his thumb sticking out there? Uh, that in Italian is called making the fig or giving the figs. Uh, today we use the middle finger. <laughs> It's the most obscene gesture you can make in the Renaissance. And he's doing it right at the back of the head of Pope Julius II in his own sanctuary. He does it twice on the ceiling for good luck. We'll see other stuff he does. He's really not happy with this, so he's getting his little uh, zetses in, his little hits in. Uh, yeah, so uh, you didn't know this was art history, did you? Is it? Anyway, let's keep going. Now, uh, <laughs> this is the original unretouched. <laughs> if you believe that, I have a fountain to sell you in Rome. Uh, of course, for, uh, for, uh, reasons of uh, of dignity and modesty, uh, uh, Adam put this on just for you tonight. He asked me if I thought it, if it made him look fat or not, but uh, anyway. Um, this is the central panel from the ceiling. Michelangelo, I told you that he puts uh, Zechariah, where he's supposed to put all the apostles, he puts five women who were fortune tellers of the ancient pagan world and then seven of the great Hebrew Jewish prophets all over the ceiling, all their names labeled so their identities cannot be changed after his death. And in the middle where uh, Julius II told him, just put my crown and my power symbols of authority ruling the whole world, uh, the Pope Julius II, uh, Michelangelo, he wanted to put in what really ruled the world, Torah. Now, he put in the first two parshiot, the first two portions of the Hebrew Bible. He starts with Genesis, Bereshit, and then he goes to Noah. Noah. Uh, now, why is Michelangelo putting in all this Jewish stuff? I told you what's going on in Florence. He's really exceptional. He's informally adopted by that family, the richest family in all of Europe, the de Medici family. Lorenzo the Magnificent <laughs> is the head of the family then. And they discover this kid who, can, at 13, he can sculpt marble than any adult in the world. And they take, them, take him under their wing. Now, they're really fond of this Michelangelo, who's pretty much been abandoned by his family. Um, the, um, uh, so he, instead of living in this sort of dormitory barracks with all the other young upcoming artists of Florence, he's brought into the palace. He sleeps in the same gorgeous feather beds with the real children of Lorenzo of the Magnificent. He eats a table elbow to elbow with them, and he gets to learn from their private tutors, who are the greatest minds in the Florentine Renaissance at the end of the 1400s. Now, when I'm speaking all over Italy, uh, and I have an Italian audience, they've learned this stuff in high school. If there's anybody skeptical in an Italian audience, they say Michelangelo didn't study anything Jewish, he couldn't study Kabbalah. I say, okay, here's his three private teachers, Poliziano, Barsilio Ficino, and Pico della Mirandola. And all the Italians instantly go, okay, you convince me, done deal. These are the three greatest uh, minds back then in the uh, 14, uh, end of the 1400s, and they were all obsessed with Hebrew and Jewish wisdom literature. His main teacher was Pico della Mirandola, who was a trust fund baby. And in his 20s, he took his family's entire fortune and he spent it on hiring rabbis to teach him to become fluent in Hebrew and Aramaic. And he had still, he still holds the records as the largest private uh, library in European history of Kabbalistic texts, more than any rabbi. He was obsessed with it. And um, these are Michelangelo's teachers. His teacher, Pico, translated Rashi's comments on uh, the creation and translated them into Latin and Italian. And uh, Michelangelo was exposed to all of this stuff. Now, it's the forbidden knowledge back then. It'd be like giving a teenager a pile of Playboy magazines. He knew it was forbidden. He loved learning this stuff. 
Uh, these books were being burnt in the rest of Europe, and here he's learning all of it with the best teachers in the heart of Florence. And he remains completely obsessed in a good way with Jews and Judaism the rest of his life. He remains a devout Christian his entire life. He is not a secret Jew. Uh, the reason he gets so angry at the popes and the Vatican and the corruption is because he's a devout Christian. He, as a Christian, is righteously outraged at the bad, unspiritual behavior inside the Vatican. And that's what a lot of these protests are about. So he knows all this stuff. Now I'm going to show you how much he knows. Now, um, in the morning prayers, and also after we do our business in Jewish tradition, we have a blessing for the functioning of our bodies, and we thank God, Asher Yetzar et Adam Bahokmah, who has created the human form, Adam, with divine Chokmah, wisdom. Now there are three things in our tradition that are created with Chokmah. The tabernacle, the holy temple, and the human body. And they all are symbolic of each other. Now, um, on the tree of life in Kabbalah, every sphere, every divine attribute of God, it's like reflexology, is connected to a part of the human body. So uh, Tiferet is the heart or the center, um, and the uh, symbol for Chochmah, divine wisdom, is the right hemisphere of the human brain. Now, for many centuries, uh, art experts thought that this image of God creating Adam here was the assistance of Michelangelo because it's too busy. In Latin, we'd say ongapuchkin. <laughs> it's just too much going on. Why does God need a royal purple mantle and all of these little uh, figures around him? Why does he have a, a shmata hanging down like a tail of a kite? Um, why does he need angels to hold him up in the air? It didn't make sense. They said, this is obviously not Michelangelo. Michelangelo likes to paint big figures like this, colossal, that look like a statue painted on the ceiling. That's his style. So finally it was resolved in 1975 uh, an American surgeon came in from Indiana, Dr. Frank Mershberger. He looked up, he said, oh my God, I studied this in Anatomy 101. Now remember, anatomy studies in Michelangelo's time, you'd go to jail for the rest of your life if they didn't kill you. So um, he looked up and saw this, and he figured out instantly what it was. Charles, can we... It's the perfect cross-section of the human brain. And, and doctors have labeled every single part of it. It's perfect. So Michelangelo says, guess what I've been doing? <laughs> and now, why did this become a secret? Because if anybody went up to Julius II and said, oh, your holiness, I know what he did up there, his first question would have been, oh, yeah, and how do you know? And that informant would have spent the rest of his life in a cell next to Michelangelo's. So everybody kept their mouths shut, and, this, and over the course of the centuries, the secret was forgotten. And he's hiding anatomy, illegal, illegally learned anatomy stuff, all over the chapel as well. But uh, if we can go backwards, thank you, John. We see here that Hashem, God, is creating Adam with Chochmah the right hemisphere of the human brain. You have the prayer illustrated right there. Remember, he's a Christian, so he will do images of God, which a Jewish artist would never do. Okay, let's go ahead. Now, uh, right over the platform that's still in the Sistine, it's a big marble platform for the throne of Pope Julius II. And he would sit there with a canopy over his head, and way above his head in that canopy, Michelangelo put the Hebrew prophet, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is showing the dark, sinister, Latin for left side is sinister side of his face, which is considered not good luck. He's looking very angry. All the other Hebrew prophets on the chapel's ceiling have bare feet to say, like Moses taking off his shoes in front of the burning bush, they're in a holy place. They're in a reconstruction of the holy temple. Except he's right on top of the head of Julius II with filthy, dirty boots. 
And also there's a hidden message that crossing them, which is also crossing energy. It's a very negative symbol. Now, he's looking right down on a trompe l'oeil parchment scroll that's unrolling right here. Now, you can still look in Vatican official guidebooks printed today, and it will say Michelangelo finished here, and it says Alpha and Omega, the Greek letters that stand for Jesus in the book of John, the beginning and the end. And then um, and this still is in all the guidebooks that they're printing today. This was one of the big things that convinced me to open my mouth in 2005 and start telling important rabbis what was hidden in the Sistine ceiling in the, in the chapel. Uh, because it's not Greek. And he did another half a year of toiling in the Sistine ceiling. He did not finish here. Let's take a good look and see what it says. Aleph and Ayin. Aleph and Ayin. Not Greek letters at all. This started me off on my investigations. Now, uh, and I did eight years of research before opening my mouth. Now, um, Aleph and Ayin are the two silent letters in Hebrew, and they're never seen together anywhere, except in one reference in the Talmud. It says that a high priest, a Kohen Gadol, who cannot distinguish between the silent Aleph and the silent Ayin, how they're pronounced, is not fit to serve in the holy temple. And he's putting this image over the high priest of the Catholic world in his holy temple. <laughs> and it's still there. And the guidebooks still say it's Greek and it's very respectful. Um, uh, you can, we can talk about this. this. You can do a whole lesson in Hebrew on this Aleph and Ayin, the numerology, everything. He's having fun with Gematria. Kabbalistic numerology, the letter values, everything, all over the Sistine ceiling. Uh, but we'll keep going. We've got so much to cover here. Now, right under that parchment of Aleph and Ayin, or right near it, right over the Pope's head, are some ancestors, Jewish ancestors, leading up to Christianity. And this is how Michelangelo gets away with the ceiling. He says, oh, it's everything leading up to the coming of Christianity. So you have all these Jewish ancestors, and we have a really minor, minor, minor name from the Torah. Uh, his name appears, I believe, only twice in the whole Torah, Aminadav, and here in Latin, Aminadav. Now, he was one of the other factors that convinced me I had to open my mouth and write a book. Uh, Aminadab is right over Pope Julius's the head. head. Now, uh, my background, as I say in my, my latest book, I, in New York City, was the go-to interpreter, a sign language interpreter, for the deaf, for the hearing impaired. It's my second language. Um, people ask if my parents are deaf. They just didn't listen to me. <laughs> So, um, anyway, uh, but uh, sign language interpreting the history of art many times in all the top universities in New York City was my boot camp in learning art history, but it also trains you what to look for in art that other people don't see, and also what's big in southern Italy, nonverbal communication, talking with your hands and your face. You know, in Rome, what we call somebody with a broken arm? Mute. <laughs> You can't do this, you can't have a conversation. Non è vero? È verissimo. So, anyway, uh, when I give a lecture, usually they have to put all the breakables out of the way because the hands are. So, he gave me a clue. Now, um, I've also studied history of sign language. He's doing a sign that goes all the way back to the uh, 1400s. It's in French, Italian, and it still remains in Canadian and uh, US sign language. It's these figures here. If you put them up here, these are the horns of the devil. Not the horns of a cuckolded husband that we like to do in Italy, but these are the horns of the devil. And uh, I mean, it, uh, let's go to a close up. Let's take a good look at this guy. He's got the devil horns pointed right down at the head of Pope Julius II. And uh, there are other signals in the painting that tell you, look at me, look at me, look at me. I won't go into them all. Uh, but there's one other thing that was shocking. An article came out in 1999 when they were getting towards the end of the entire cleaning and restoration of the ceiling. The uh, restorers found something shocking. They found a yellow circle 
right there. That's the sign of infamy that the Inquisition imposed on the Jews of Western Europe. Uh, if a male went out in public, a Jew, and mixed with quote unquote proper society, uh, he had to wear a sign that he was a cursed Jew, and it was a yellow circle sewed onto the left side of a cloak. Uh, Jewish women had to wear a yellow scarf, which was the sign of being a prostitute. Now, this was not an invention of the church. This tradition comes from Sicily. In about 1887, there was a decree by the Muslim governor of Muslim Sicily, and he decreed that Christians had to wear an insulting sign, and Jews had to wear insulting signs. And these signs were yellow, because for them it's the sign of prostitutes and dog urine. Uh, and this was revived by the Inquisition in medieval Christian Europe. And uh, then, of course, the Nazis revived it again during the Shoah with the yellow star. Now, uh, why is he there with this right over the Pope's head? The Pope and the Vatican are intolerant to the Jews, intolerant to the Jewish faith. And uh, we have to look at the name of this person. Let's go back one, please, Charles. It's Aminadab. Now, what does that mean in Hebrew? Ami Nadav, from my people, a prince in the Christian tradition. Who is the prince? The prince of peace? Jesus. And from what people does he come? From my people is screaming Aminadav at Pope Julius II. From the Jews. You treat the family of Jesus like this? He's your prince? It is a sign of protest, of intolerance and mistreatment of the Jews, making double horns right down as a j'accuse against Pope Julius II and the Inquisition, right over his head, and it's still in the Sistine forever. Let's go forward. Okay, now this is not by Michelangelo, this is uh, after Michelangelo, this is the engraver Gustave Doré, and he illustrated the Jewish Bible, and this is the plague of poison snakes in the wilderness, and to uh, save the Israelites in the wilderness from the poison snakes, uh, Moses puts up his rod and hangs a copper serpent, Nachash uh, Nachoshim, on it to heal people. Now, uh, in all Christian art history, they always put a cross beam to say it's the precursor for Christianity saving souls, the serpent saving the Israelites in the wilderness. So they turn Moses' staff into an early uh, incarnation of the cross of the church. And in all Western art, you'll see his staff transformed into a cross. There's only one exception I've ever found in all of art history. On the Sistine Chapel ceiling, it's just a single rod, just what Moses was using, no crossbar with a serpent on it. Uh, and this is also a Greek symbol of, of healing as well, but there is, he puts no Christian symbolism even in this corner painting. There really is zero Christian symbolism. Now he's getting the same rotten paycheck from Julius II. He would have had much less arguing and trouble if he had gone ahead and done the safe thing. Every single panel, he has a choice. Do the standard Christian version or risk my life and career by doing the Hebrew version. He always does the Jewish version, Likvod HaYehudim, in honor of the Jews. Let's keep going. Now, uh, after he finishes the ceiling, uh, 22 years later, he's dragged, kicking and screaming, back into the Sistine to redo the front wall. The Pope at that point, Clement VII, is one of the children of the de Medici family who slept in the same down bed with Michelangelo as kids, ate with him, grew up with him, had the same teachers. He said, I'm on to you. Don't do Jewish stuff like you did on the ceiling. The front wall, I wanted to be Christian. So you were right about that point. The ceiling, zero Christian. The front is a very, very Christian story. The last judgment, when Jesus comes back to earth, judges the souls, all the good souls come out of the grave and go up to be with him in paradise. All the bad souls go down to Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> Uh, right, around, right around Jesus is a group called the elect. They're the elite. They are the holiest of all holy souls. 
They're the ones who get to spend paradise closest to Jesus. Now, who could not get into paradise, according to the Vatican and the Inquisition, in the early 1500s? Could Muslims get into paradise? No. Uh, Protestants? No. Um, Native Americans or Asians in China? No. Uh, Hindus? No. Jews? Absolutely no. Now, I found something that was the last straw, and it was uh, the, the last drop that, uh, that made the vase of water spill over. Now, um, I found something there, and the church is still trying to figure out how to deal with this. Michelangelo's technique was to fill this, all his artworks with these indicators. If you know sign language and nonverbal communication, it's plain as day. It's like the paintings are shouting at you. And they're saying, look at this, look at this, don't look at me, look at that. So um, all I would tell you is if you're one of my friends in my little subversive group, my underground group trying to clean up and reform the Vatican back then, he was in a lot of secret societies and reformist groups. Um, I'd say, okay, when you go into the chapel, look at the front altar wall, look at Jesus. His right hand is up in the air, lifting up the good souls. Now his right hand is gonna be pointing at an angel, all dressed in red, so you can spot the angel instantly. And the angel is pointing to the real secret, don't tell anybody. And people go in, I still do this to people, I don't tell them what they're gonna see, they have to get very strong binoculars, so tiny, 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 tiny. You wanna see what the angel's pointing to? Hello. Um, we have two Orthodox Jews in paradise, right over Jesus. Now, we have one big clue. <laughs> And I can entirely identify with this friend. But there's other stuff that's uh, less subjective, shall we say. Uh, this Jew here is wearing the hat that the Inquisition in Western Europe imposed on the Jews. It's another sign of infamy. They made males wear a hat with two peaks like this to convince the ignorant, illiterate masses that Jews were hiding devil horns under their hat. That's why it was designed. This is for the Jews under the Inquisition in Western Europe. How about the Jews in the East under Muslim dominion? The Jews under Muslim rule had to wear a turban of the shameful color yellow. We have a Jew of the West talking with a Jew of the East. Now, I have seen many artworks in Catholic uh, frescoes of Jews who did, under pressure, give up being Jewish and they are never like this. They show their heads uncovered. They're no longer a Jew, they, never, they don't have to cover their head again, and they make the sign like this, that they have accepted the Trinity, the dogma of the Catholic Church. This guy is making a well-known symbol for monotheism. Michelangelo has Noah make this on the ceiling 22 years before, so he's echoing the fact, he's talking about monotheism, one God, they're still wearing their hats, they haven't had a nose job, they are still religious Orthodox Jews in paradise, right over Jesus in the inner circle. If the Vatican had found this, he would have been burnt alive and the wall would have been destroyed. Uh, when I pointed this out to the director of the Vatican, he said, um, oh, I've never seen that. Okay, uh, oh, David and Moses. And I said, well, if we're going to play that game, we need the iconography. David is always shown with his harp and his crown, and Moses always with the luchot, with the tablets. These guys know. They're still trying to figure out how to explain it. I said, what's the matter? He's making a bridge between Jews and Christians. And now that's starting to sink in, thank goodness. Uh, let's keep going. Now, after he finishes, 
the chapel. This is near the end of his life. He never stops fighting with the popes. He lived so long. Back then, you were a medical miracle if you lived to 50. Most people died in their mid-30s. He makes it to almost 89 years old, sculpting until three days before he dies. Uh, he, they call him the divine Michelangelo while he's alive. He's like a miracle. Um, so uh, one of the last popes he works for, I think it is the last pope he works for, Pope uh, Pius IV. Now, Pope Pius IV was an incredibly knowledgeable, cultured pope, but corrupt, and he was very snobby. He told everybody he was from this great, noble, wealthy family with a lot of uh, yichas, with a lot of great family prestige, and um, he wasn't. His father was a wandering street barber. If anybody seen Man of La Mancha, uh, they had the Bacinella. The Bacinella is this cheap metal basin, uh, and they would do anything. For, you need a tooth pulled. You, you need to, to have a uh, leech put on you for bleeding. You need to have a shave. You need to have a tooth pulled. Anything. And th this is what the barbers would do. And they would wander around the streets with their bacinella, this little metal basin, and a towel draped over it, looking for customers. And they'd sit you down in a corner, pull out a tooth, make you gargle with some vinegar, which was their antiseptic, and ask for some money from you, or shave you, or do any of the other things I listed. And the Pope kept this as a secret. He didn't want anybody to know he came from such poor, humble roots. So Michelangelo is ordered, this is one of his last commissions, to do Porta Pia. This is the gate of Pope Pius IV in his honor. And uh, architects went nuts over this. This is so far reaching. This is uh, a whole new dimension of architecture. These great designs that we've never seen before. It's amazing. Well, let's take a close up. Now, by the way, I did not figure this one out. The Vatican published this themselves. They said, we have to admit, he finally he pulled another one over our eyes. Let's take a look. That's a bacinella, a, a poor street barber's basin with a towel draped over it. Now, this idea, I told you Michelangelo's not the first to start hiding insulting messages and secret protests and things like that in his work. Everybody in Italy has been doing it down through the centuries. Now, we can skip three centuries after this gate and a, an architect in the 1800s if we go back one, he made the extension. He put this uh, turret on top. And uh, this was not part of Michelangelo's plan, but they wanted to be higher and uh, show off more of this gate so you could see more easily from anywhere in that neighborhood. Let's go ahead, too, and let's see what he put on that. He, for good luck, stuck a block of soap in the middle. <laughs> Three centuries later, he's still doing the insult game. He's fo a follow-up for Michelangelo. They're all doing this. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, OK, let's back up one. Back up one, please. OK. Now, Michelangelo dies at 89. There's so many stories we could tell about his death. You'll have to read the book. Um, uh, anyway, uh, the Romans want to bury him in a church designed by the architect and commissioned by the same pope who built the Sistine Chapel just to make him suffer in his tomb forever to be in a church by, by those two people. So the Florentines do an emergency, uh, they get out their pushkas and they do an emergency fundraising drive all over Florence to raise enough money to hire the two top burglars in Florence. They send them to the Rome, and they steal Michelangelo's corpse. Now, maybe because he's friendly with the Jews, they wrap up his corpse, they put it in an ox cart, and they, design, they um, disguise him as a pile of schmatas. And he is taken overnight in the darkness, and at dawn they arrive in Florence, they take off all the rags, and they put him in a tomb of honor in a church in the middle of Florence. Now that church is Santa Croce. It's like the Westminster Abbey of Italy. All the famous people in Italian history and art and science, they either are buried there or they have a monument there. Uh, and Michelangelo is buried there in his tomb. Now, uh, that church had no facade. It had a bare brick front. 
Uh, it was unfinished. And finally, at the end of the 1800s, they had an international competition to put the front on the church where Michelangelo is buried. And the winner was Nicholas Matash, a Hungarian Jew. He says, wow, I get to commission a Hungarian Jew to put the front on one of the most important churches in all of Catholic Italy? Cool. I want my name on it. <laughs> and the authorities said, no, 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 you don't sign a church. <laughs> all of our Catholic archives, nobody could put their name on it. He was devastated. So they negotiated and negotiated. And here's the compromise. <laughs> Now, Michelangelo, who spent his life and his career trying to make a bridge between the Jews and the Christians, is buried in the church with the largest Star of David on it in all of Europe. Uh, and I'm sure he would be very happy about this. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, the book came out in 2008. It's uh, in over 25 countries in uh, umpteen languages. If anybody has a publisher in Israel, I want it out in Hebrew. It's still not out in Hebrew. It's, uh, well, let's take a look and see where it's out in some other places. You might have to click a second time on some of these. Okay, of course in French, uh, um, and then um, uh, in Italian. In Italy, I, we, uh, I, my publishers were at Zoli, and they've lost track of how many editions. It's one of their all-time bestsellers of uh, art history. Can we go back to that other? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 go ahead. Okay, double thing. French, okay. Uh, Italian, next. Okay, that's Japanese. Okay, and again. Uh, this is in Portuguese, both in Brazil and Portugal. And again, let's see here. Uh, this is a huge hit in South Korea. The South Koreans are obsessed with Talmud. Every house has at least one book about the Talmud in it. And they were obsessed with this book. Um, by the way, Japan, they did a whole feature documentary. National Japanese TV came and did a whole documentary about the secrets of Michelangelo, the Jewish secrets, because they feel that the Jewish family tradition and the Japanese family tradition have a lot in common. Let's keep going. Uh, this is from Russia uh, and uh, Poland. These are just a few examples uh, if, of all the different languages that's come out in. Uh, they did a documentary on ABC Nightline, Good Morning America, uh, and uh, this is Martin Bashir. He's the one who um, broke the uh, story of uh, the shenanigans of Michael Jackson, and he was determined, he's a religious Catholic, he was determined, and he told us to our faces, Rabbi Blood and I, that he was going to shred our reputation and the story of the book in public on the air, and he tried desperately uh, and uh, uh, could not punch a hole in the story. He went to uh, William Wallace, who's one of the world's top living experts on Michelangelo, and during the show he says, uh, so Professor Wallace, Michelangelo, Kabbalah, I mean, impossible, right? And he said, oh no, no, Michelangelo was in the Domenici Palace. Everybody in there knew Kabbalah, everybody's talking about it. So what's the question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that's how the documentary went. And, they, and it, it became a New York Times bestseller, Baruch Hashem, thank God. It's a big uh, Kiddush Hashem. Uh, Rabbi Blech and I both feel we have, we have to be very, very uh, upfront and very, very careful and very, very documented because we're representing. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, and now I'm allowed to research all over the Vatican. This is a shot you will not see. Uh, I was allowed inside with the Pieta. I'm behind a foot-thick piece of bomb-proof glass that's protecting it. Uh, <coughs> the Pope enters from a secret door back here, and this is his entrance. Uh, um, and I was allowed to go in there and do some research. Uh, as Peter told you, I was, it's just dumb luck, but I found the model for the Pieta. Uh, it's an <coughs> unknown masterpiece by Michelangelo at 22 years old. Uh, and uh, you'll see next November, it's, it's, it's very exciting. Let's keep going. Uh, I was asked to speak, I don't know where this is, but I was at this place in the US, in Washington. They had me speak there. 
Um, let's go on. Um, this, I had to f um, bring in more guides. This is my cultural association in Rome. Uh, Peter talked about this. Some of you have been on tours with my uh, madrechim, my docents. I train them all. Uh, they all know the Sistine Secrets. I'm usually either out of town uh, doing lectures like this or research, or in the summer I have to go into hiding because I can't take the heat. Um, so if anybody's interested, uh, Elaine has uh, cards. She has a whole pile of cards. My lovely assistant. Um, and... Um, uh, so please, uh, you'll come and you'll hear secrets of Jewish stuff all over Rome. The Forum, the Colosseum, everything. We'll keep going. Um, my second book, Secrets of Caravaggio, that's completely sold out in Italian. Uh, now we're negotiating with a documentary coming up to have it republished in Italy. I'd love to see it in Canada. Hint, 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 if anybody knows publishers here. Uh, my third book was about the discovery. I cannot show you the whole model because uh, I want you to be surprised, right, Felix? We're not going to give away the whole surprise. Uh, but this is a little glimpse of the one part of the back of the statue. Uh, we'll keep going. Uh, by the way, I was also invited, I was hired to be the uh, historical consultant for a book called, uh, for a movie, I mean, a Hollywood film called The Nativity Story. They called me up and said, do you want to do this, The Nativity? Uh, of Jesus, and uh, I said, is Mel Gibson involved? Because <laughs> I will tell you, and uh, this is an honest, I, don't, I, I haven't told this in public before, his people contacted me a few years earlier to do the Passion Jesus. I said, Passion Jesus, who's doing it? They said, Mel Gibson. I said, no, can't do it. Uh, they said, you busy? I said, I will always be too busy for Mel Gibson. <laughs> and um, They said, we need somebody to consult for the Aramaic. Now, I'm not an Aramaic scholar, so, uh, so I was doubly happy to turn it down. They said, do you know anybody else in Rome who could help us with the Aramaic? I said, I'm in the Jewish community. I know dozens of people who study Gemara. They know the Aramaic like that. They said, really? I said, yes, and none of us will help you. <laughs> So they found one poor Jesuit who did the job. So um, when, uh, at one point in the Aramaic, they're saying, well, let's go to the Holy Temple. They're actually saying in Aramaic, let's go wash our laundry. <laughs> and that doesn't bother me at all. Now, uh, I was very, very uh, flattered that I was hired to be the consultant for the nativity story. Uh, they said, you know the nativity, uh, and uh, the, there was a phone interview long distance from Hollywood. I said, uh, I'll give you the story in a nutshell. It's a boy. They said, okay, you're hired. <laughs> so, um, and these were Jewish producers, and it was a very nice story. Anyway, um, and in this version of the nativity story, they're Jews, they kiss mezuzahs, they say a prayer before eating bread, and uh, it's the Jewish, most Jewish vision of the Holy Family in the Christian narrative you'll ever see. It's the only film in history to have its world premiere at the Vatican. Now I'm walking in, dressed like this, with this. Um, you know, there's only, uh, people ask me, do you have problems being the only guy in the Vatican walking around in white yarmulke? I say this one other guy. <laughs> So I'm walking in with my yarmulke, and the Swiss guards in these, you know, these gorgeous uniforms they wear, uh, they look like a joker from a pack of cards, but they're serious soldiers, I'm good. and they stop me, and they say, uh, are you, where are you going? I said, I'm, I'm invited to the world premiere here, and I'm walking in, I had become friendly with the actor and actress who played Jesus and Mary, the parents of, in the nativity story, and uh, they say, uh, how are you walking in here? Who invited you? I said, I'm here with Joseph and Mary. <laughs> and they said, okay. <laughs> and that was the end of that. Um, 
I made some good friends in there. This is the latest book. It came out in Italian. It just came out in English, but it's not in hard form. You have to read it in ebook form. And I have to say, Rizzoli did such a good job. If you get it digitally, the illustrations are much sharper in the digital than in the printed. Uh, so you, it's called Hidden Beneath the Beauty. If you just Google my, uh, put my name on search on Amazon, you can download it there. And this is Kabbalistic secret messages, both Jewish and Christian, hidden throughout all of Italy, from the Alps all the way down into Sicily and Sardinia. Over all the centuries, everybody is hiding these messages before and after Michelangelo. So the hunt is on, and you'll see lots of messages hidden all throughout Italy. You can keep going here. Uh, now, in the book, the new book, I, everybody asks me the question about the Vatican, the menorah, the menorah, is it in the basement, in the basement, in the basement. Now, um, they don't let me down into the basement of the Vatican. So um, uh, I cannot tell you it's there. Until I see it, I can't tell you it's there. I keep getting into off-limits areas and checking out a secret tunnel here and there. I've been a lot of secret tunnels down there and a lot of passageways, a lot of buildings that are off-limits in public. I haven't seen anything. So uh, I, just to avoid that question. So uh, the menorah, this is the image, of course, in Sha'al Titus, the Arch of Titus. And uh, in the new book, I list seven different uh, theories, all the legends down through the centuries of what happened to it. And they all contradict each other. So you decide. Uh, let's keep going here. Uh, now, this is very interesting. This was discovered by the top art history expert from Scotland. He was rifling through a cardboard box he found on the floor of a closet in the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum of New York City. He was just looking at little design elements and details. He found this, he said, oh my god, I recognize that uh, style. That's Michelangelo. It's an unknown sketch by Michelangelo. <laughs> Uh, near the end of his, uh, middle of his life, middle to end of his life, we don't have an exact date, but it's during the time the Inquisition is bearing down on him and his Jewish friends. And you know what it is? He didn't dare make the whole image, but if you imagine coming out of the parts where you would screw in the branches, it is a seven branch menorah. And every art expert on the planet has said it is 100% Michelangelo, and it is a menorah from back then. And this is now called Michelangelo's sketch of the menorah. Um, so uh, let's go to modern times. I told you, I showed you that example of uh, the gate from an 1800s artist putting his messages in. Well, let's go to modern Italy. This is the parliament building. The, uh, the building called Montecitorio. It's the uh, Parliament building of Italy. Now, when I'm giving lectures in Italy, this is one of their favorite pieces of history that they did not know. Uh, the name for the Parliament is Montecitorio, and they don't know what it means. It comes from the Latin, Mons Accettorium. What is Mons Accettorium? That means the hill that accepts Accettorium. This was the garbage landfill of ancient Rome. Everybody threw their trash here. And now it's our parliament where we throw our politicians. <laughs> the senators of Italy love this story. I haven't told it yet to the parliament of Italy. Now Bernini designs the building, and this is where the parliament meets back here. Now uh, the piazza, this is a rare shot of what it looked like in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. It was disgusting. In Italian, we say, pugno nell'occhio. It's a punch in the eye. It was so ugly. Uh, so they had a competition, one more artistic competition, to do a, you've seen the TV show, Extreme Piazza Makeover. <laughs> that's, that's what they did here. Uh, they had garbage cans and parking and, uh, uh, you know, the politicians and, and anybody who come here and park right from the parliament and they didn't want that anymore. They, we have a joke in Italy. A guy's parking his car right in front of the door, the front door of the parliament and the policeman comes and says, Signore, Signore, what are you doing here? You can't park your car here. The, the politicians come through, the senators, the ministers, the deputies, everybody comes through here. You can't park here. And the, and the Roman says, don't worry, don't worry, I have my anti-theft alarm on. <laughs> That's real Roman humor. Anyway, 
Uh, so they have a competition and an architect, we say, uh, delle origini ebraiche of Jewish roots wins the competition in 1997. That's how recent this is. Now, um, he designs this, let's go ahead, uh, and he has to deal with this ancient Egyptian obelisk brought to Rome by the first emperor Augustus Caesar. And there's this pointer on top, it's a sundial. So he puts back the median strip with the bronze measurements of solstices and equinoxes leading right up to the front door of the uh, parliament of Italy. Let's take another look. Uh, here you can see the median strip, and he puts in just three simple marble strips there uh, to make it look like steps, but it's a little ramp, so even people uh, who have walking problems or in wheelchairs or scooters can go up there and into the parliament, so it's, uh, it's equal access, and uh, people are very happy. It's simple, it's clean, it's a nice design. So uh, a few years ago, I go to this hotel right here at the edge of the frame here. There's a five-star hotel, and I walk in, and I go up to the manager, and he says, wait a minute, are, are you that Jewish guy I see on TV? Do we have a secret in my hotel? <laughs> he got so excited. I said, as a matter of fact, yes. He's jumping up and down. I said, I want to go up on the roof. He said, listen, things aren't that bad. <laughs> don't do it, don't do it, you're still young. Uh, but uh, I said, no, 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 you want to see the secret? We all got to go up on the roof. And uh, he gets on the intercom to the entire staff. He says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Professor Dolliner, who does all the secrets in art, is here with us. We're all going up on the roof. The entire staff of the Five Star, they get a, uh, like a coffee break, and I got the whole staff up on the roof. And they'd all been working there for years, and they never saw this. <laughs> so this Jewish architect wanted to illuminate the parliament of Italy with the spiritual light of Chochmah. Chochmah, wisdom, is the center flame of the menorah. So he put the cups and the flames inside the parliament building to illuminate our politicians. And every time I give this lecture in Italy, the Italian public says, it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> So the game is still going on, and like I said, there are secrets today, there are secrets all over Italy. Artists, if we have any artists in here, you know you hide personal stuff in your work. Everybody does it. Now, uh, what Michelangelo was trying to do is exactly what Peter said in that fine introduction, which was, my work is, I'm just trying to carry on. I'm like the Shalia from Michelangelo. Uh, I'm his messenger. He left a message in a bottle five centuries ago about religious tolerance and freedom of thought, open-mindedness, and sharing culture, making a bridge between the Jewish world and the Christian world, to have not just tolerance, that's such a weak word, but brotherhood. And I'm trying to do his message. And Rabbi Blech, my co-author, and I go around the world giving these lectures to mixed audiences everywhere. Uh, and making Jews proud of their heritage, which was hidden by the Inquisition for centuries, making Italians proud of their heritage that they did not know about, and making people enjoy the history of art. If you've enjoyed tonight, I'm happy. Thank you. So we have time for just uh, two or three questions, if anybody has questions. Where's the hello? Oh, okay. 
Okay. You, you warned me already. Okay. We'll do one. I came as a skeptic. Okay? Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, and I'm getting more and more to your side, perhaps not 99%, but whatever. Uh, I do thank you for that. I've been to the Westminster, uh, to Westminster Abbey, and you probably have been because we're always in Europe and we love it. But the point is, on the stained windows, you have all the Magen David. They're all Magen David. And of course, Michelangelo didn't work there. So they have this problem of putting the Magen David. But my understanding was, it's their legitimization. It's their validity. They need the Old Testament to validate them. Because even in Isaiah, you have an virgin is a child. So uh, basically, that's, that's my understanding of why there is so many Jewish symbols. That's a wonderful point. The, but remember, Winston, it's long before Michelangelo, and at that point it is not a Magain David. It is a symbol of mystical wisdom of the ancient world. And they want to say that the church is a font of spiritual wisdom. So you will see the six-pointed star in many churches, basilicas, cathedrals, all over Europe, and it's a sign of mystical spiritual wisdom. Uh, but also, yes, England is far removed from a lot of the excess, uh, the, the, the bad behavior in the Vatican, so they can do things that are more, uh, let's say, um, uh, brotherhood oriented yes, to, the, to say we're from this root. They also have the Hebrew writings on the wall. Sure. And I told the priest over there, what are you trying to do? Obviously, they're trying to bring in unsuccessful. Jews show them this is also your place. So, uh, the wonderful thing about art, ten people can look at it and have ten different points of view, but these are very, very uh, standard and common and widely accepted interpretations. Many people say the same thing you do. I also say it, that they're trying to make a bridge. So, um, so absolutely. Bramante is the one who heads up the whole thing to get Michelangelo on the ceiling and out of his head. As you said, Bramante is the head architect for Pope Julius II. Michelangelo, among all his other expertises that he self-taught, he's one of the top experts in engineering and architecture at that time. This 22-year-old kid is brilliant. And um, Bramante is afraid of getting shown up by this young Florentine upstart. So to get him out of the way, I'd say get him out of his hair, except Bramante was bald. Uh, to get him out of the way, he gets Michelangelo stuck with this horrible project of painting the ceiling. Also to push his protege, Raphael, absolutely correct. Over here, sir. And I'll get, I'll get over here. Okay. Uh, how did he get away with putting the labels, the names of the prophets? Because two things. Number one, after the Pope saw his beautiful, handsome profile on the ceiling, he didn't set foot back in there for another year and a half. So Michelangelo went right ahead with his completely own design. The other thing is that uh, he told the Pope, all of this is showing everything's leading up to the coming of Christianity. So uh, the Hebrew prophets are not prophesying about uh, the Jewish God, they're prophesying about the coming of Christianity. And the Pope said, okay, go ahead. Uh, over here, this young lady. Santa Croce, can we go back a few? It's the church with the Magen David on the front. Okay. There we okay. There we go. Oh, absolutely. Not only that, ma'am. Um, yeah, absolutely. Good point. As I tell you, he's making a bridge. So are they making with this church. If you look at this Magain David, if you uh, if you get a good uh, blow up of this, it says four letters. 
that are important in the Christian tradition, I-N-R-I, Jesu Nazareno Rex Judeora, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And uh, that is there to make a bridge between the Christian narrative and the Jewish faith. So uh, the church itself is making that bridge. Well, I, listen, I have many good Catholic friends in the Vatican who are very highly educated, who are scholars. We can't say about a whole group of people they don't understand their own holy text. I will tell you, up until about 50 years ago, that religious Catholics were forbidden to read or study their own Bible on their own. You had to go to church and hear an, a representative of the Catholic Church explain it and interpret it for you. So it's only within the last couple generations that Catholics can even read their own text at home. Now, um, uh, the, what they're trying to do is make a bridge between the two faiths. So um, if uh, I, as a Jew, I don't want to hear somebody telling me, you don't understand that Christ is the real uh, thing and that the only way to heaven is through the Catholic Church, and I don't want to tell a Catholic, oh, you got it all wrong, you don't know anything. So, uh, because it's faith. It's not a scientific experiment that you can prove in a laboratory. If people want to believe something, they have the right to believe that. So, um, oh, otherwise we're just getting into a shouting match of you're wrong, you're wrong. So, um, yes, uh, over the centuries, Catholics were kept from studying and learning their own works at home on their own. But today it's available, and many people now are critically analyzing the uh, Christian Bible just the way we've been doing it for 2,000 years with our holy text. that a lot of master's works have been, um, there's paint, painting art underneath, like a canvas or something, that when they're restored, during restoration, they find another painting underneath with religious symbols like Judaic. You can find this all over where there's been censorship. There's one artist I'm researching now, Giorgione. He's from the northern part of Italy, and uh, many scholars believe that he's a secret Jew and I'm starting to uh, research it now. We know one painting where he probably had Kabbalistic images held up by a clearly Jewish figure that's painted over and put into, I think, astronomical figures and, and symbols. So um, this is happening a lot. Sometimes the earlier image will bleed through. It's called a pentimento, a, a, a memory or a rethinking. And of course, they find a lot of stuff in x-rays as well. We're finding amazing discoveries in art with new techniques of uh, reflectography and radiography that we didn't have before. So uh, we're finding secret stuff all the time. Yeah, good point. Uh, other questions over there? We'll take maybe one more over here. Okay, please. Yes, I mean it up. You're very observant, but I will tell you not to get fooled by, uh, this is a photo that I took from a book. In the Vatican publications, they never will have a large image of this and several other panels from the Sistine ceiling. So uh, this comes out a lot more yellow than what you see in real life. If you come back one more, I think it's truer to the color. This is much truer to the color that you would see. So I'm sorry that my bad photography uh, misled you. Okay, that'll cost you another ticket. <laughs>
Well, you're very observant, and I have no way of proving it. Remember, uh, Rabbi Blech and I are very, very careful. So until we find real documentation of something or that it's so obviously in your face, like uh, the symbolism here and the hats, um, that this is indisputable, this could be a, a guy from the south who's very tan. It could be Sicilian. It could very well be a Moor, which is a Muslim uh, from Africa, up in paradise as well. This guy here, I have a suspicion that it's Michelangelo's private teacher who taught him all of his forbidden Jewish knowledge, Pico della Mirandola. It looks a lot like him, but I can't prove it yet. So the stuff that is absolutely indisputable, that's what I talk about. This and this, it's, it's very debatable. It's up to people's point of view, but you're very observant. Um, uh, over here and over here, okay. You'd have to have very long arms to get out of there. Yeah, you need two handles to put it, but uh, uh, you could do that. But uh, he's, uh, the Vatican's report as well, they said, this is a bacinella. If you know what it looks like, uh, that's exactly a bacinella with a towel over it. Uh, but we would need the, uh, the pitcher. So, no, that's just a cube of a block of soap. But uh, if you want to climb up and put in a picture, uh, I won't tell anybody. I won't say a word. Um, by the way, uh, the gate, this last thing Michelangelo did, insulting the Pope, and remember Michelangelo is a very, very strong supporter of the Jews. This is a great story, and it's all true. In uh, 1870, the Italians had finally united against the Papal States, against the military, material, earthly rule of the Pope Kings, as they were called, and they overthrew the power of the Popes all over Italy. The last bastion of the Pope's military occupied zones was Rome, and he called it my property, my holy city of Rome. So the entire liberation army um, of the uh, Italian rebels against the Vatican and the Pope, uh, a mass in front of that, this gate here on the other side, and uh, they have their cannons aimed at the walls of Rome. They're gonna blow a hole through the walls of Rome and take Rome. The Pope, Pius IX, sends a special courier running across Rome under a white flag, and he delivers a message to the re rebel army. And it says, you're all Catholics. I'm the Pope. The first of you that orders the cannons to fire upon my holy walls of my holy city of Rome, I will send you to hell and all of your family and your descendants in perpetuity. You will all roast in hell forever. <coughs> and the battle froze. Everybody just stood there and stopped the liberation of Rome ground to an absolute standstill. And the general at that time, General Cadorna, he, he thinks and thinks and thinks. He gets up on his horse. He says, gentlemen, anybody here Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> and a little sergeant, Giacomo Segre from Turin, he says, uh, Signor C. He says, yes, sir, I'm a Jew. He says, sergeant, come up here. Get on my horse. I want you to give an order to the cannons. <laughs> so they had a Jew order to fire the cannons on Rome because he couldn't get excommunicated. And that's how Rome was liberated in 1870, right through <laughs> Michelangelo's gate. Uh, okay, so uh, one last question, one last question. Okay. Uh, sir, you've been very patient. Uh, with all of these beautiful stories, it's fascinating. What kind of um, political resentment or political pushback have you been receiving from the Vatican and other authorities that say, wow, it's so full of it, and what kind of problem do you have? Wonderful question. Uh, Charles, can we go ahead to that menorah there in front of the parliament? Slowly, don't overshoot it, please. Okay, we got through. Yeah, it's after the books. The, um, it's a wonderful question. At the beginning, there was serious talk about a formal papal condemnation or banning the book. 
Then they had a conference and talked about it. There were only two authors before Rabbi Blech and myself. Uh, okay, we'll stop right there. Rabbi Blech and myself. Only two other authors before us had been officially condemned by the Vatican. Uh, J.K. Rowling, <laughs> for glorifying witchcraft, and Dan Brown. I begged the Pope to condemn me. <laughs> I went to his window at midnight throwing stones at the guy to wake him up. Nothing. They learned their lesson and they said, we're not going to condemn the Jews. Nah, <laughs> you're not going to get that out of us. So, uh, yeah, they did that. Uh, so, uh, but there was a lot of discussion. They had, they had other people who were um, lay members of the church write scathing reviews of it. Uh, one Jewish uh, journalist in New York didn't even read the book, but he condemned it because he thought it would stir up anti-Semitism. Um, so um, from art experts and artists, we got glowing reviews, thank God, from official historians. The number one art historian for the United States Embassy in Rome and who wrote all the official guidebooks for the Vatican risked his career, and he wrote the preface because he said, you're absolutely correct. Finally, I understand the chapel. I'll write you the preface, religious Catholic art expert for the Vatican. Now, um, the big turnaround is when it came out in Italian. The Vatican told the entire staff, thousands of people who were for the Vatican, don't you dare look at a page of that book. The next day it came out in Italian. They ran to the bookstore. <laughs> And they cleaned out all the shelves and all the bookshops uh, in Rome. All the guides bought copies. Um, it was the forbidden fruit. So they, um, they went nuts for the next year. Every time I walked into the Vatican Museum, an official in a beautiful suit or a uniform in front of a guard would say, Signore, here please, now. And I'd go, yeah, 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 I see. And they'd go, well, I got this for my wife. Can you write it nice and straight? <laughs> went on for over a year. And uh, now the Vatican quotes uh, our facts from the book. Uh, it's used for PhD papers around the world. Other people are basing their uh, history research on it. It's opened up a whole new field of study of secret imagery hidden in art. And the Vatican now is very happy with it. Let's go to the next slide. There's your answer. Um, I got to meet uh, Pope Francis just before I came here to see you. Um, and uh, we, were, we were introduced by Rabbi Marvin Heyer of the Museum of Tolerance and the Seaman Wiesenthal Institute. Uh, and he was sweet and charming. Uh, he, had, he knew who I was, and I was invited to this private audience. Um, it was not a Catholic holiday, it was just a private audience, otherwise I would have said, good young to the pontiff. But, that just slipped out. I don't know. Uh, this is a very rare photo, because for the first time in history, in one photo, you see the only two men allowed to wear a white kippah in the Vatican in the same photo. So thanks for all your questions. And I'll